as you are able, please stand for the reading of our scripture this morning, which is taken from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one would speak the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength of God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God to us, the people of God. Well, good morning, church family. It is good to see your eyes, and I can see your smiles under those masks. It is great to be in God's house together. Good morning, church family online, wherever you are in the world. It is great to be in worship together. If I don't know you, uh, my name is Tom Parkinson. I'm the senior pastor at Dutill Church. Is it not a blessing to hear live music in the midst of a pandemic? And to the handbell choir, thank you so much for uh, bringing that blessing to us today. What a gift uh, to hear music together. It's such an important part of our worship. I want to invite you to reflect with me on a question that I've been thinking about over the last few weeks. How do you measure the quality of your life? I mean, what is it that makes a life good? You know, as I've been thinking about this question, I've noticed that social media is actually a, a fairly good barometer for what we think makes a good life. Because whether it's Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook, people put a lot of pictures out on social media. And in general, people put pictures out to make their life look good. You know, people don't want to put out a picture to make their life look bad. So the pictures begin to tell us something of what we think is the mark of a good life. So I want you to take a look at a few pictures that I found on social media. First, we have a picture of a young lady who's just finished a color run, and she's flexing her muscles, you know? And you might look at that picture and think, wow, what a great thing she did. I wish my life was like that. Or you've got the fellow in the corner, he's attending the Super Bowl, and you might think, wow, what an experience. He's at the Super Bowl game. I wish my life was that good. Or the classic picture of somebody's toes with the ocean on the other side, and you think, oh, her life must be great. She gets to go to the beach. I wish I had her life. Or you have the person who posts the selfie with their house, and their house looks like an absolute mansion, and you think, oh, what a good life they must have to live in a house like that. Or you have the couple with the perfect smile, and you think to yourself, wow, what a great life they had. And, and, and psychologists actually talk about social media envy, where oftentimes we look at pictures like this and we become envious. We think, that looks so good, I wish I had that life. Meanwhile, what you don't see is what happens when those cameras get turned off. And that couple that's smiling so brightly, when the camera's turned off, they're fighting constantly and they're not sure if they're going to make it. Or that woman who's looking over the top of her toes into the ocean, the thing that's going on in the back of her mind is she's been estranged from her father for three years and she's wondering if they're ever going to speak again. Or that girl who finished the color run and is flexing her muscles, that she doesn't feel very good about herself inside and every day she fights a debilitating depression. You see, when it comes to measuring the quality of our life, we could look to our experiences, or we could look to our material riches, or we could look to our successes, and none of those things could actually guarantee a quality life. There's only one thing 
that guarantees that you'll have a quality life, and that is the health of your relationships. I mean, it's true, isn't it? You can have all the degrees, you can have the best job, you can have the nicest house, but if you don't have healthy relationships, you just don't make it in this world. Relationships are critical. And all of us have key relationships in our lives. If you're married, you have a relationship with a spouse. If you're a parent, you have relationships with your kids. We all have relationships with our family and our extended families. And when you get to the extended family, sometimes it gets complicated, right? Shake your head if you know what I mean, right? We have relationships with, with our roommates. We have relationships with our coworkers. We have relationships with our bosses. We have relationships with our church family and with our neighbors. And we even have a relationship with ourselves. We have a lot of relationships. And if any one of those relationships is on the rocks, or if any one of those relationships is strained, it will reduce the quality of your life. How many of you have had a moment in your life where you laid awake in be, awake in bed at night because you were off with somebody and that relationship strain is stressful, right? Relationships are the critical measure of the quality of our lives. And yet, we live in a culture that doesn't do relationships very well. It was the pastor and author Andy Stanley who made this reflection that in American culture, we are experience-rich and relationship poor. You you think about it, in the United States, we live in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. We have more conveniences, luxuries, and amenities than any people group ever. If you want to experience something in this country, by golly, you can experience it. You can climb a high mountain. You can go visit the Grand Canyon. If you want to go to a casino, it seems like there's always one within 20 minutes. If you want any kind of cuisine in the world, there's a restaurant somewhere that's serving it. I even saw the other day, if you're really angry and you just want to break stuff, you can actually pay money to go to this place where you can break stuff, right? You can experience anything. So we are experience rich, but relationally, we're not very good. As a matter of fact, uh, psychologists have been doing studies for years, but they've discovered that America is one of the loneliest civilizations in the history of the world. 40% of Americans indicate that they feel loneliness on a rather regular basis. That's 100 million lonely people. What is loneliness? Loneliness is that feeling we get when there's some kind of deficiency in either the quantity or the quality of our relationships. There's a loneliness epidemic in our country, and it's an indication that we're just not good at relating to each other. Parents, you know this, what are the pressures that we put on parents? But we put on parents the pressure to make sure that your kids experience everything. So we make sure they get to every program, every practice on time. We make sure they get to go to every camp they want to go to. We make sure that they get every opportunity to go to the school that they want to go to. We give them experiences, but we never have dinner together. Right? Or, or our kids grow up and they start to have relationship troubles and they feel like they can't talk to their parents about it because we don't spend time with our kids talking to them about relationships. We are experience rich and relationship poor. And that's not a good recipe in a world where our relationships are the measure of the quality of our lives. You know, God designed us for relationships. If you read the book of Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, six times God said, it is good, it is good, it is good. You know the very first time in the Bible that God said it is not good is Genesis chapter 2, when God looked at Adam, the first human created, and God said, it is not good for Adam to be alone. And so God created Eve to be a companion, a partner, a helper to Adam in life. Isn't it interesting that the first thing God sees and says it's not good is an isolated human being? God made us for relationship. And yet, if we are honest about it, many of us struggle with relationship. I'm willing to bet every one of us in here could identify one or two relationships in our life that just isn't in a place where we want it to be. Maybe you don't get along with your boss. Maybe you're having trouble with a friendship. Maybe you and your spouse are having a lot of friction, right? We could probably all point to a relationship and say that relationship just isn't what it should be. 
Well, today and over the next few weeks, we're going to launch into this series called Relatable, in which we want to become more able to relate to the people in our lives. And we're going to seek God's wisdom for our day-to-day relationships. Now, I want to begin today by talking about having a vision for your relationships. Do you have a vision for relationships in your life? Chances are you don't. What do I mean by vision? By vision, I mean a forward-looking focus in which you can see the direction and purpose of your relationships. Generally, we don't have a vision for our relationships, but you have a vision for other things in your life. You probably have a vision for your personal finances. It may not be written down, but you have it. You know, some of you, you might be saving for a particular goal, or you might be trying to tackle a particular debt, but you have some kind of vision, purpose, focus in your finances. Uh, You might have a vision for your career. You you know where you want to go in your career. You know what kind of job you want to have. You know when you want to retire. You have plans for that. Uh, Many of you have a vision related to your homes, Right? You, you know when you want to renovate the kitchen and when you need to replace the roof, and you know when you have a plan that you're going to sell this house so you can downsize at some point. You have a vision for your home. So we have vision for our finances, vision for our careers, vision for our homes, but how many of us have a vision for our relationships? No, we don't. And yet relationships are the most critical factor in the quality of our lives, and so I think we need a vision, a direction, a focus that, that can help us in our relationships. And so to, to, to kind of begin to lay out what that vision would look like, I want to return to the letter of 1 Peter. Now, in our last series, we were reading through 1 Peter, and I just want to make one more pit stop there, because 1 Peter is really helpful in, in thinking about our relationships with others. Because as you recall, 1 Peter is written to Christians who were experiencing grave hardship. They were undergoing persecution. And so they had this really hard pressure on them from the outside. And that pressure on the outside started to fray the relationships inside the Christian community. You know, this is something that can happen in our lives. When when some circumstance in our life that's really stressful can strain our relationships with others. Have you ever had this happen to you where you, you have a really hard day at work and you're stressed out about it, and when you come home, what happens? You're really short-tempered with your kids or with your spouse, right? And, and why are you short-tempered with them? Because you're allowing this, this strain on the outside to come into your relationships. Right? Or even think about this pandemic that's going on and all of the stress and the disruption and the uncertainty. We're, we're kind of a culture on edge, and have you noticed that we're not relating to each other very well in the midst of the pandemic? There's a whole lot of finger pointing and a whole lot of strain in relationships that's happening in the midst of this. Well, that's what was happening in the days of Peter. There was this pressure from the outside, this persecution that was fraying relationships inside the church. And so what Peter wants to do is he wants to speak a word to those believers and to us about the importance of relationships. And he begins in 1 Peter 4, 7 by just making a very simple statement. He says, the end of all things is near. The end of all things is near. And, and what Peter is, is referencing here is he's referencing the end of time when Jesus returns to earth and when the kingdom of heaven comes to earth. And so immediately what Peter is saying to those disciples is, guess what? Jesus is coming again. And and when you think about your relationships, you need to think about them from the perspective of eternity. And when Jesus returns, it's not going to matter how nice your home is. It's not going to matter how many degrees you have hanging on the wall. It's not going to matter how much money you have. But your relationships are going to matter in that moment. Your relationship with God and a relationship with God that can only be worked out in your relationship with others. That's what's going to matter. And so it's almost like Peter is saying to those believers, hey, just remember from the perspective of heaven, whatever hardship you're going on today, it's not worth sacrificing the critical relationships in your life. 
because the end of all things is near. And so what Peter does then is he unpacks for us five ingredients that are crucial to our relationships. And I think this is really Peter casting vision for our relationships. There's five ingredients that you need to bake into the critical relationships in your life if you want those relationships to be healthy and life-giving. The first ingredient is prayer. Peter says in verse 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Now, what is prayer? But prayer is the foundation of our relationship with God. The way you relate to God is you pray. And so, right from the outset, Peter wants us to see, if you want to have a good relationship with others, it starts by having a solid relationship with God. And I would dare say to you that if your relationship with God is not right, it will be difficult for you to have good relationships with others. And so the first ingredient to healthy relationships is prayer. But notice that wedded to prayer are two words that we talked about last week, and they're really important, being alert and being sober-minded. Last week we said if you can be alert and sober-minded, that's kind of a remedy to anxiety. And prayer gives us alertness and sober-mindedness. In other words, prayer allows us to be more aware of what's real and what's most important. Now, think about the relationships in your life. How many of you have ever been guilty of making a molehill into a mountain in your relationship, right? I mean, it happens to us all the time, right, where we allow some little thing to blow up and become a big thing. What happens in prayer? But prayer gives us an alertness, a sober-mindedness, a way to see what really matters and what doesn't. And sometimes it's in prayer that we learn that, you know what, we can just forgive and move on. Other times, it's in prayer that we can look inside ourselves and realize that it's not always their fault. Sometimes we played a role in why our relationships are on rocky soil. Prayer can be a sustaining exercise in your relationships. So let me ask you this. How many of you pray for your relationships? Most of us, if we're honest about it, we don't. We pray for circumstances in our life. We might pray for particular people, but we don't really pray for the health of our relationships. What would it look like for us to pray and say, you know what, God, I want to be a better father to my children. Would you improve the relationship that I have with my kids? Or to pray and say, you know what, God, I'm having a really hard time with this coworker, but I want a better relationship with my coworker. Lord, can you show me the way to that? Or, or, or God, I, I really can't get along with my sister these days, and we just don't see eye to eye on anything. Lord, would you, help, would you help our relationship? What would happen if we began to really pray for our relationships? I think if we just did that alone, we would begin to see transformation, and we might become more relationship rich in those moments. So we want you to take prayer seriously in your relationships, and so beginning this Wednesday, we're inviting everyone in our church to take five. What's going to happen is every Wednesday when you get your weekly e-news from the church, or if you check the church Instagram and Facebook, you'll find a very short video, and that short video is going to invite you to take five minutes out of your day to pray for your relationships. Five minutes. You could do this on your lunch break at work. If you're kids and you're virtually schooling, Megan, you could probably figure out how to get five minutes in the middle of your school day, right? We want everyone in the church to take five minutes on Wednesdays to pray for your relationships. And let's see how God can begin to work through that. So the first ingredient of healthy relationships is prayer. The second one is love. Love. Now, when I say love in the context of relationships, people often think of romantic love, but really what we mean here is love in the broadest sense. Love that is the kind of love that God shows us in Jesus. Listen to verse 8 of 1 Peter 4. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Do you notice what love does, Peter says? It covers over sin. So what is it that tends to fracture relationships? But it's when we fall into sin. We fall into some kind of 
hurt or hardship or mistake, and only love can cover over that. The only way a relationship can ever survive when there's hurt is if there's love. Because love is self-giving, and love is willing to not define somebody by the worst thing that they've done, right? If we don't have enough love in our relationships, then they're doomed to fail at some point. Now, love is a word that we use a lot, but I don't think we use it a lot in the context of every relationship. We'll talk about love in marriage relationships, but do you know that you can have love in a relationship with your boss? You can. It's not romantic love, but you can have that kind of love, right? The kind of love that looks over sins, the kind of love that's willing to self-give, right? We should be seeing love in all the critical relationships in our lives, Because love is the only thing that's going to allow us to get through it in those moments when we step on each other's toes, and we will. So the first ingredient is prayer. The second ingredient is love. The third ingredient is hospitality. Listen to verse 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. What is hospitality? Hospitality is welcoming somebody with a generous spirit. If you've ever received hospitality, you know that somebody was thinking about you and what you needed, and they went out of their way to make sure that you felt that you belonged, that you felt that you were welcome. Well, that's critical in our closest relationships. But I've noticed something. When our relationships get strained, we tend to cut off hospitality. What does that look like? We hang up the phone, we shut the door in their face. We separate. We don't want to be in the same room with them. We don't want to talk with people anymore, right? There's no hospitality in that kind of relationship. Well, Peter is saying, look, a a, a great aspiration in, in your relationships, if they're going to be healthy, is you need to have a hospitality and openness to the other person in which you value the person more than any issue. So I think about this in my relationship with my kids. I know that my kids are going to make choices that disappoint me. Any parents out there seen that, right? Your kids will make choices that disappoint you. They will do that to me. But I also know that that's not a reason for me to be inhospitable to them. I want my kids to know this. No matter what choice they make, no matter how disappointing that choice may be, they can always come home. Right? And they can always pick up the phone. And they can always come and talk to me. And I might not like the choice they make, but I'm going to be open and generous in welcoming them because that's important. If hospitality is an ingredient in your relationships, it means that you're always open to the other person's presence, that you're always open to trying to hear things from their perspective. You may not always like what they choose. You may not always like what they've done, but you're at least open to them. And I think this is highly critical. I can tell you, when we start talking about extended family relationships, I see too many extended families in our culture who can't even get in the room with each other. They can't even open enough hospitality to gather around a dinner table together because some issue has become between them. If hospitality is a part of our relationship, it means people are more important than issues, and we're open to people. Okay, so we've got prayer, we've got love, we've got hospitality. The fourth ingredient of our relationships is service. Verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others. So, so Peter says to Christians who are getting on each other's nerves, Christians whose relationships are starting to fray, he says, you should take whatever ability you've got and you should put it to use to make somebody else's life better. That's what service is. And any relationship that we're in, we ought to be looking for ways that we can serve the other person, that we can lift them up. As a matter of fact, a great exercise... If you are in a relationship that is strained with somebody, if you're in a time of conflict, a great thing to do is stop focusing on trying to win the issue and just think about, how can I serve this person today? How can I serve them? What's something that I can do that would make their life better? Service is just love and action, right? That's all it is. But service is something that unlocks a certain key in relationships because what it does is it says, that you know what? It's not really about me. 
My role is to set myself aside and to take what I have and to use it to lift somebody else up. Service is a key ingredient in relationships. And finally, Peter says our words, and particularly our godly words, are an ingredient. Verse 11, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. How many of you know that your words are critical to your relationships? You've probably seen it where the wrong words, hurtful words, can ruin a relationship. But the opposite is also true. Because godly words can speak life into a relationship. Did you know that the primary way that God speaks to us is through each other? It's true, God can speak to us other ways, but the primary way God speaks to us is through each other. It's in the context of our relationships with each other that we hear God. And so we should take that pretty seriously because that means that our words and what we say to the people in our lives have the capacity to be God's word to them. So when you're speaking to people, think about it this way. If God is in the room, would I stand by these words in the presence of God? We've been given the opportunity to speak words, godly words, into people's lives. So those are the five ingredients. Prayer, love, hospitality, service, and godly words. And what Peter says is this is a recipe that if you bake it into your relationships, you're going to find relationships that are more fulfilling. In a culture that is experience rich and relationship poor, we need to focus on these ingredients. And so my challenge to you this week is I want you to pick a relationship in your life. It could be any relationship. doesn't matter. And I want you to take that relationship to the Lord in prayer, and I want you to think about these five ingredients. How are they present in that relationship? And if they're not present in that relationship, how do you introduce these ingredients into that relationship? And if we started to do that, if we started to become more consciously intentional about implementing this roadmap in our relationships, we're going to begin to experience healthier, more life-giving relationships in our lives. And that really is what God wants for us. God wants us to have healthy relationships. Let's pray together. God, you made us to be in relationship with others. And yet we confess, God, that there are times when we get so wrapped up in the things of the world and we're so worried about our experiences and our our accomplishments and our successes that we lose sight of what matters most. And what matters most is our relationships, our relationship with you and our relationship with others. Lord, we pray that you would make us faithful to take these ingredients, prayer, love, hospitality, service, and godly words, and that we would bake these into our relationships. Help us to use these ingredients so that we might bless others as they bless us. And Lord, I know that there are some listening today who have a real strain in a relationship in their life right now. And I pray, God, that you would bring healing and transformation that you'd bring forgiveness and reconciliation. And God, that you would make us all more relatable so that we might honor you through the relationships in our lives. For this is the prayer that we offer in the mighty and strong name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.